Hello and welcome to uh, our winter pond fishing, Ask an Angler. So we're going to go over uh, how to catch some bass and crappie and sunfish and catfish in your farm ponds um, or, you know, small lakes, small city lakes, things like that um, throughout the winter months. So we're just kind of heading our way into winter now. Water temps are still fairly warm. They'll start to fall off here in the next few weeks as those overnight lows and cold fronts from the north come through. Um, so we'll jump right into uh, kind of what we're looking for, you know, with small bodies of water, you know, anything under probably 15 acres, um, you're going to have rapid warming and rapid cooling just based on any front that comes through. Um, one of the big things that we look for when we're fishing big reservoirs is uh, we really don't like the days where it's clear blue skies, nice and sunny, no wind. Um, but in your smaller impoundments, your farm ponds, your city lakes, um, those are going to be days where you're going to get rapid water warming, which is going to improve the fishing. So, you know, really any of the, and it's kind of cold to be out on a boat, even on a nice day during the winter. So, you know, it might be 65 degrees, but, uh, you get a little chilly out there on the big water. So those nice warm front uh, days, you know, may only be a day or two, but that's usually enough to turn a pond to get it fishing pretty good in the winter. Um, it's also the time of the year where you're more than likely to catch the biggest bass that you're going to find in those ponds, um, especially as we get into January and February. Um, and they haven't had a lot to to eat on those insects and frogs. Um, and in some bodies of water, if the temperatures get too cold and crawfish going to hibernation um they really only have minnows to eat so and that'll be the same for all of your other species that are in that pond what they're looking for so primarily when we get into the winter months and ponds um your primary bait species for all of your fish are going to be you know minnows so whatever you have in there it could be small fry uh from crappie largemouth um catfish and and your sunfish, uh, if you have it stocked with anything, you know, you might have shiners, you might have shad, you might have ghost minnows, mosquito fish, anything like that. But uh, when water temps really get down into the 40s, um, you're really looking at your primary bait being, you know, fish, uh, maybe crawfish a little bit. Um, but like I said, you get down to that low, low 40s. Um, not only are your, is your fishing probably going to shut down um, pretty considerably, but uh, you're prey base is also going to um, kind of dwindle. So we'll kick in. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this, feel free to use the chat bar. It's meant to be conversational. So moving through fat too fast, or you think of something um, that you want to talk about, go ahead and throw it in that chat bar and we'll just address it as we go. So like I said, um, the small pond, you know, it doesn't matter if it's quarter acre or it's 10, 12 acres. Um, they're going to cool and heat at about the same level. Um, depending on the type of pond you have, if it's just an earthen dam where it's kind of a bowl shaped, your deeper water is going to be out towards the middle. If you have any type of drainage, if you, if it's a dammed Creek um, or any type of runoff that comes in, you're going to probably have more of a defined channel that runs through the middle. Um, and then if you have a big earthen dam, there might be some dredged out ditch that's right along the dam. Um, that kind of connects with what your creek bottom is going to. So when those water temps start to get in that, you know, below 55 all the way down to 40 degrees, the majority of your fish are going to, you know, be hunkered out in that deeper water um, near any type of structure break. So it could be you know, stair steps down, um, could be just a sloping sloping bank that goes in your ditches near the dams, your Creek channel that comes through, especially if there's any type of hard cover that's down there, whether it be submerged wood, um, brush piles, anything like that. Most of the ponds are, you know, they're, they're going to muddy up a little bit in the winter. You lose some of that vegetation. So especially in central Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, Northern Oklahoma, um, where you, ju you just don't have a lot of that vegetation to begin with. And the water's already typically stained. Um, that muddy water will actually warm faster. So um, if you have rocks, any type of riprap, things like that in shallower water, um, when you get those warmer days, if it's 60, even into the 70s, and we get you know several days like that all from December all the way through February, 
Um, it only takes a day or two, especially if the overnight lows, if we get southern winds and the overnight lows stay above 45, you know, even better if they stay over 50. That's all it really takes. It can it can really move fish into the shallows because all of those bait fish um, are going to kind of go in and around if you have hard lay down hardwoods, riprap rocks, um, all of those bait fish will push up, especially midday, you know, um, the morning bite in the winter, you know, you're, it's, it's a nice time to fish when you get nice days to be able to go out and walk around a pond, especially if it's 65 degrees, no wind, that, you know, it's perfect weather. The water temps may only be 48 degrees, 50 degrees. Um, but on a, on a calm day with clear blue skies and the sun out at 65, it'll really warm those shallows. I mean, two, three, maybe even four degrees. Um, and that's enough, especially with, if you have hard structure that's up against those banks that kind of absorbs that heat and radiates the water around it, those bait fish will push up into that. So those are the areas that you're looking for, um, on any type of Southern fronts that we get where that warm air will kind of come and block in, across the state for just a couple of days. Um, and then vice versa, you get a big cold front that comes through. It's apt to slow fishing down um, a little bit. It doesn't mean you can't catch them. It just, you typically need to be out in that deeper water. So that's where uh, a kayak, a small boat, anywhere where you can fish vertically above fish. Cause the biggest thing in the winter is low and slow. You want to be dragging right along the bottom at a snail's pace. Uh, your bass, your crappie, your sunfish, um, they're going to be out, you know, hovering around any type of cover that they can get into in that deeper, more stable water that is less susceptible to up and down changes. But in small bodies of water like ponds, your average depth is probably going to be somewhere between six and 12 feet. So you're going to get water warming out in the middle as well as that top water kind of absorbs that radiation and you get turnover in the water. Um, so knowing where those areas are. So if you don't have, you know, a prolonged warm stretch that comes through, you know that you're looking to target at this time of year, your deep cover, your deep structure. Um, and if you can fish in a vertical presentation, that's going to be even better. Um, so slip corking, drop shotting, those are great options in the winter. It helps you just hold, uh, you know, right in a good zone. Um, big bass, uh, you know, they, they'll take, They'll take a little tiny lure at this time of year. They'll also take a, you know, a big meal. Um, you just won't catch very many fish. But if you want to flip a big, you know, pig and jig, pork trailer, any type of, you know, crawfish imitating trailer um, with natural colors, you can work those along the bottom, either on a bladed jig, a uh, football head jig, and just run those just barely at a snail's pace, just kind of working them along the bottom, hopping up over logs, over humps or ridges or drop-offs, anything that you got, um, brush pile, things like that. You're apt to find, you know, one really, really big fish, um, but you could spend all day. So the smaller the body of water, the better, because um, those fish are just going to be concentrated. You start getting into five, six plus acre bodies of water. That's pretty substantial. Um, you're, you know, the bigger the body of water, the, the more apt you are to be out in a kayak, in a canoe, little John boat, something like that, so that you can, you know, vertical presentations. But ponds that are under four, three acres, which are most HOA ponds, farm ponds, um, neighborhood ponds, small city areas, um, close to home bodies of water, they're going to, you know, they're going to be less than three acres. So in those cases, you're really looking for any type of defining structure that's in there. Is there a drainage that comes in or is it just a bowl? And if it's just a bowl and you can walk all the way around it, then your best bet is probably throwing slip cork out there and just kind of working all of that. Um, if you're not overly familiar with the pond, it's better. Winter fishing is a lot easier when you really know the contour of the bottom of the pond. So if it's your own pond and you know it really well, that's better because you know where those pieces of structure are. Um, and that's where your fish are going to be hanging out. Cold water colors for crappie. Um, so usually chartreuse is, is tried and true, but um, when you get to the winter months, sometimes just natural colors are going to work. They certainly are better for bass and bluegill. Um, you know, crappie can be a little finicky. So if you throw down, you know, something that's like this, you get chartreuse, um, 
that can work, but I try to stick with more natural colors when you get into the winter. Fortunately, a lot of the ponds that I fish have golden shiners in them. So something like this can go a long ways. Um, but that's outside of just a chartreuse um, or kind of a green yellow. I'll usually stick with you know, more natural bait presentations, silver, gold, um, dark blue, something like that in the winter months. But it, you can change it up. It, it just kind of depends how much pressure the crop you get in the ponds that you're fishing, what they're looking for. But typically with uh, chartreuse is pretty much good year round is a good starting color. But if you're not finding them on something like this, you know, you have to switch over to something that's a little bit more natural. And these do, this is a great, you know, gold back this is great for like golden shiners um but your silvers whites pearls um and then something like this a little dark blue kind of black back things like that but keeping it natural it's a good way you can pick up a lot of bass especially in smaller bodies of water by just slip cork in a baby shad um the bass are just more willing to take smaller meals especially bigger fish at this time of year um but let's just kind of get into uh, kind of what lures you're looking for to, to use at this time of year um, that are going to be most effective for you. Like I said, slip corking is great at this time of year, especially on bull shapes. If you can only fish from the bank, um, you, you have a lot of options with slip corking. The, more, the most traditional way is just standard jig head with some type of tube, uh, little creature, spray. Uh, little baby shad, something like this. Um, knowing your depth, uh, if you're fishing out in the middle, using a slip cork obviously allows you to change your depth often, um, which is a big benefit, but you're really going to be inactive. So if you're just going after crappie um, or bluegill ready or something like that, uh, you're, you'd probably just stick with some type of baby shad, you know, Strike King, Bobby Garland, anything like that. Uh, if you got a little paddle tail or just a little pulse tail, something like that, you can try ones that have ribs on the body. It's just going to give out a little bit more action, but most of the time fish are just taking it on a complete dead stick. So you really don't need to do a lot of, um, you know, jigging the bobber in, um, maybe just an occasional pop just to move it a little bit to get it swinging. But these things, when they sit down in the water, 32nd ounce jig head, up to a 16th ounce um, you don't need an eighth ounce you're not fishing in that deep of water um, but you really you want to get it down on the bottom um, so if you know what your depth is and you can put something like this about a foot above the bottom around heavy brush or heavy submerged logs any rock piles anything like that that's going to concentrate fish slip cork in any type of baby shad is going to be very productive for crappie um, and then you're going to have the opportunity to catch bass doing that as well as your sunfish species. Um, you might even add something, some type of scent. Crappie nibbles work great. You can add that to your hook point, um, especially in some of that muddier water. Berkeley, the power bait crappie nibbles, they make the chrome glow. So it gives off a little bit of a glow in the water. So if you have just a little bit of off stain, just a little bit for attracting um, and then it's got the scent on it. So if you can scent your lures, they make lots of different options for spray scents or dip scents, things like that. Um, but the fact that you're fishing so slow, you really, if you can have extra scent, that's going to help that fish just hold on to it. That little bit extra, um, especially crappie that have such a tendency, especially if you're fishing a slip cork, they'll come up and that bobber might not fall over. They just come up and grab it, hold it right there. Um, and then they've let go before you even notice they're not, you typically aren't going to get that big pull under, especially in the winter from that bobber. Um, so your baby shads tubes are great. Um, probably my favorite all around pond lure at any time of year, but especially in when I really need to slow down the presentation is going to be something like this. These are little squirm and squirt tubes. They come in three different sizes, an inch and a inch and a half, um, and then a two inch, and then a two and a quarter. 
the inch and a half and the two inch are pretty much the same body size. Not much of a difference just on the two inch. There's just a little bit more of a tail, but these are great. Um, they're Bass Pros brand, Crappie Max. Um, but any type of little tubes like this, you can get jig heads that are like this that are meant for tubes. Again, Bass Pro, they make a squirm and squirt head that accompanies these. These are great. 32nd ounce, 16th ounce. And you just work these up inside of the bait, which is great for natural presentation. But if you get into fish pretty good, especially pan fish, they can really tear these up pretty good. And the only inconvenience is, is you have to completely cut off to retie because it's internally weighted as opposed to it being on a jig head where you can just pop the plastic off. There are some other options that you could do if you didn't want to internally weight it. You could use um, a really, I don't have any of the really small ones, but something like a Ned head like this. These Ned heads are great because they have on the hook shank, a little back facing bait clip right here. So if you get like a one sixteenth, um, usually these, these net heads, they're Z man. Um, they come in, they don't come in your traditional sizes. So it's like a one fifth, one tenth, one fifteenth. So a one fifteenth ounce, one of these, you can just go right in through the nose of a tube and then work that hook point all the way through the hollow body till it pops out and then it'll pull up against the head. And then you can just use your thumb back there and just kind of push in and it'll catch on that bait clip. So that's an option. The only deal with these is it's a little bit longer hook shank. So this would be ideal for bass fishing. Um, you're, you're kind of hard pressed to get a two inch or a inch and a half on up just the hook shanks too long, but these are great. This, this is my go-to. Um, on a 32nd ounce or a 16th ounce and you can cast them straight out and let them fall down to the bottom and just a really, really slow, steady retrieve with an occasional rod tip pop, just so it gives it just a little bit of action. But these do a great job of imitating just about anything in the water from bait fish to crawfish, to frogs, to insects. Um, tubes are a great option year round, but especially in the winter months. Um, and they don't, if you're fishing ponds that get some pressure, uh, if it's a public body water or something like that, most people don't throw tubes um, in those small bodies of water. So something like this is something a fish probably hasn't seen a lot of, but even if they have, I've fished the same ponds for a decade using the same thing. Um, and I continue to have success with that. So tubes, great option. Um, but keeping it to a 16th ounce, I like a 32nd ounce. Um, you can usually get away with it in the winter with bigger bass. If you can cast six pound test with the 32nd ounce without getting any backlash or crow's nest, I recommend a 32nd ounce. Um, you're just going to get a really slow fall rate. And then when you're reeling it in, it's just barely going to be hopping along, which is enough for you run that by down logs or any type of structure breaks. If there's a bass sitting there, typically, if you can put it right in front of their nose, you're going to get hit. But those bigger bass, your four plus pound bass, they're they're lethargic. So you're going to you might get one good run out of them. But typically, if you're using a medium action rod with six pound test, you can hold on to fish up to 10 pounds. Um, just have your drag set really good. They'll give you one good run. And then after that, it's you're typically just forking in dead weight because that water's so cold. They don't want to fight. Um, but if you wanted that, those are kind of my options for, if you want to just keep it simple, usually all I'll take to a pond at this time of year is those little tubes and then just some baby shad with a couple of jig heads. Um, and I'll work that. You can run them on a drop shot off the bottom. You can run them under a slip cork or you can just straight cast and retrieve. They're really versatile. You can put anything, you know, you get it just a pack like this and pre-rig some baby shad and some tubes you can just throw them in a pack like this and put them in your pocket um but if you want to get more bass heavy um and and try for a big lunker by using some bigger profile baits we'll go through that um typically in ponds i really don't like to use hard lures um so i 
typically don't, but you can have success with using hard baits. You just, it's easy if you know the pond. If you don't know the pond, you don't know what's down there. Hard baits are expensive. You don't like hanging. I don't like throwing treble hooks, but a kind of a rip stop or so these are these rip stops right here these are great jerk baits they get you can really hit them and stop them hard but they have just kind of a very slow rise jerk baits are great to work around ledges or drop offs um most of the time those bass are going to hit it when it's suspended so you're just really really slow working a jerk bait in just one rip and let it sit there for three, four, five seconds and then pop it again and just four, but you're not working that bait hard like you would in the fall or, or the spring when it's just quick rip, quick rip, quick rip and going like that. You just, you can throw one of these out and it might take you three or four minutes to reel it back in. Um, but if you can put this right in front of a bass's face, just that little slow wobble, a bigger meal, um, some bass in ponds are willing to go feed. Other ones just want to stay hunkered on a piece of structure and they want a big, easy meal. And that might be the only thing they eat all day. So just a big high calorie meal. And that's where you can get away with a big jerk bait, a big jig and trailer, um, but spinner baits, uh, crank baits, lipless crank baits, uh, you know, plugs, top waters, anything like that. You're just probably going to be moving it too fast. So stick into soft plastics or something that you like a jerk bait where you can, you know, give it some action, but m most of the time it's just that slow, steady rise that's going to get you bit. So outside of jerk baits, you can try spinner baits and crank baits, but m more often than not, you're just going to find hangups and you're just going to be going way too fast and bass aren't going to be willing to give chase. So if you want to go with a bigger profile bait, a real good option is a using a jointed swim bait so this is just a magic shad different brands are called different deals but it's basically a jointed soft body bait with a paddle tail so you'll have this and you can throw these out on um, just a regular offset or extra wide gap offset hook size three aught to five aught is going to be good um and with these, what I like to do in the winter in a pond, you don't need any weight. So you just have, you know, a three aught to five aught wide gap offset hook. And all you're going to do is go right through the nose. Or you pull it out through the bottom like that. Pull it up the hook shank to where it gets up there to the top at the eyelid. And then you'll run that hook point back through the bottom body of the bait. This one right here is has an opening on the bottom, so you could internally weight this with a hook shank that's got a weight on it. But in ponds, I like to go weedless and weightless. So just like that, that hook point comes up through, and you can bury that hook point. You just pull the plastic forward a little bit and then let it slide back. And now you got a weedless, weightless minnow. And with these, you're just going to cast to great to pitch around, you know, any type of, uh, you know, standing hardwoods or anything that you may have, but these are great. Cause you just let this fall. And you know, all this looks like is just a, you know, your bait fish, your minnow, your shad, your shiners, especially in that really cold water, you know, fish, you'll have fish kills, especially on bait fish. So this will just flutter down. You'll cast straight out, just let it fall down to the bottom. Um, on the first, when you're letting it fall, leave your bail open for a little while to, because it's not going to have a lot of weight to pull down. So if there's any type of wind or current, if you snap your bail, what's going to happen is this will start to fall, but now it's starting to come back towards you. So just leave your bail open for four or five seconds, just so it has enough to, to get going and just let it fall all the way down to the bottom. Um, let it sit there for 30 seconds and then just go from three o'clock to 12 o'clock with your rod tip. And all that's going to do is it'll just pop this up off the bottom about a foot or two and then it's going to flutter right back down. It's going to be slow and painful fishing, but you can get some real lunkers with, you know, fishing a swim bait. You could do it with a brush hog. You could do it with a crawfish trailer. Anything that is going to get their attention on just a slow flutter with a bait profile 
keeping somewhat of natural colors. So, um, you know, this, this has got just a nice little purple flash through it. So this could, you know, mimic any of your sunfish in a pond that's died and it's fluttering down. But these are great um, going with just a soft plastic swim bait to go weedless and weightless and let it fall and pitch it around any type of structure and cover that you can. Um, and just really, really slow. And all you're waiting for, you're not going to get that big vicious bite because most of the time you're slack lined. Um, so really all you're watching for is any movement in your line whatsoever. So if you pop that up and bait comes up off the bottom and it's fluttering down and you can kind of see your line trying to sink back and all of a sudden it pauses, any action whatsoever, if you see your line shoot, pause, twitch, reel up, until you can feel if there's any tension on there. And if you feel tension, hammer that hook home. Um, because unlike the spring and the fall where if you get a drop and that bass comes and hits it and starts to swim a little bit with it, you'll see your line start to move or maybe it hit it really aggressively and your line's really shooting out in front of you. But in the winter, it's just something as simple as just a twitch or a pause in that line. So with these, uh, if you're going to throw weedless and weightless, uh, fluorocarbon is great because it sinks and you can also keep a little bit more tension um, to your tip. So it's more sensitive, doesn't have as much stretch. So if a bass does come up and grab with fluorocarbon um, or braided line with a fluoro leader where you're extra sensitive on your touch, that's great at this time of year. With monofilament, um, if you're using that, you can get just that little bit of stretch. And if a fish comes up and grabs it and it's not scented, it's just, you know, soft plastic, odds are the second they hit it, take one little chomp down on it, realize that it's not real. They open up their mouth, spit it out. You never even knew you had a bite. So fluorocarbon and braid can go a long ways in the winter just for the sensitivity for the rod tip. Mono just has, it floats and it's got a little bit of stretch in the line. So when you're fishing weedless and weightless, you can miss a lot of bites. Or if you're slip corking, drop shotting, things like that, just that little bit of that stretch that monofilament has, um, can keep you from feeling bites, especially in the winter where it's more just a, either an up bite or a behind bite, but they're not grabbing it and running back there. You, you're usually fishing so close or in the cover and structure that those fish are just, just a quick grab and holding on to it. Um, bladed jigs or just straight jigs, swim jigs, football head jigs. Um, also good options. If you want to go with the bigger profile, bait so something that's in kind of a natural color of your green pumpkins um green pumpkin uh your blacks and your blues things like this the blade most people if you're fishing you know the spring the fall the summer fishing rivers creeks whatever you throw out these bladed jigs and most of the time you're just straight cranking it in and that blade's giving you a nice little flutter and it's just like a bait fish just skirting along. But you can use these to mimic, you know, dying fish, bluegill or whatever, feeding down off the bottom or even crawfish. And having that blade on there, especially if you're in some murkier water, just getting that vibration um, to bang it off of logs or rocks or whatever's down there. Um, instead of swimming these straight in, whatever trailer that you choose to use, you can use trick worms. You can use, uh, you know, anything double tail, just some type of, of trailer that it's going to give you the option to mimic both crayfish and bait fish. Um, those are going to be your best bets, your blacks and blues, uh, uh, green pumpkins, browns. Um, but you want to kind of stay away from probably your, real bright colors, chartreuse, whites. Bass have a tendency in the winter to get spooked by those non-natural colors, whereas when they're in the spring and the fall and they're a lot more reactionary and aggressive, they'll go after those brighter colors, but you really want to keep with the more natural colors um, when you're in the winter. But just something like this, especially some of the, the newer soft plastics that are out there uh, that float, that really they don't, you know, they're not going to sink. If you drop them on the water, they float right there. Those are great options to have on a uh, on a jig because when you're popping it along and you're letting it sit there that bait is up here as opposed to kind of a slow fall down to the bottom so it just gives you an extra couple of seconds to allow that bait to sit there and still have some action before you pop it up again 
Um, but bladed jigs, especially in more offset uh, colored water, are can give you just that little bit extra as opposed to just throwing a straight jig that might have a rattle inside of the head um, or down the, the shank of the hook. Um, but you're, you're really just looking to create just a little bit extra vibration in that muddier water. But if the water is clear, then you probably get away with just using a straight jig um, if they have good visibility. But anytime that visibility is a little bit stained, which typically the ponds in central Oklahoma, western Oklahoma tend to run a little bit off colored in the winter because they lose that vegetation to help soak up some of that silt. So anytime you get rain, strong winds, it just turns up the bottom of these kind of mud ponds that we have around. Um, as far as your crappie and your sunfish go, you're really looking at, you know, a vertical presentation, a slip cork presentation, or just fishing straight up off the bottom, uh, with bait. So if you can use live minnows, great. Use live bait at this time of year. Um, especially if you have the ability to vertically fish, fish below a slip cork even fish off the bottom. Um, you can get a floating, floating jigs and tie these off with a leader line to a swivel and some type of, uh, bottom bouncing weight. Lindy rigs come pre-packaged ready to go for you in that respect. So those, uh, those are good options to have. Um, or you can just, you know, go very basic and just put on a Aberdeen plain shank, bait holding hook that you would use for sunfish something that looks like just a size size six or size eight plain aberdeen hook and you could maybe just put on a couple pieces of split shot and throw it out there with a night crawler let it sit down there on the bottom um, but the majority of these fish they're just going to be hunkering down into any type of root wads stumps things like that so if you have a very small pond with only a few deep sections that you have or a creek channel that comes through, being able to put live bait in the middle of that will really up um, your catch rate, especially on things like if you're trying to catch some bigger sunfish during the winter months, your big red ear, your big bluegill. Um, this, now is kind of the time that you can catch them in the winter months, but it's just fishing with a with a live, live night crawler, just kind of tied off of any type of bait holding hook fished off the bottom. Um, otherwise, if you can get up off the bottom a little bit by using a jig, you could, you can run a full night crawler off of something like this, where you get a floating jig head and then just tie yourself on a little dropper hook and you just thread some of the worm up here and then bring it down and thread the rest of the worm on this. And this will float up off the bottom, um, with this back hook kind of anchored down. So you're going to have a worm depending on how long your leader is, you probably only need about a 12 to 16, 18 inch leader. And then this is going to rise up and you're going to be eight inches, 10 inches up off the bottom with the back end of your worm four to six inches up off the bottom. So that can be really productive to catching just about anything. Um, small blue or bluegill and smaller fish like crappie and other sunfish, they might just come up and grab the back of it. So you can still get a good hook set, but bigger fish, catfish, bass, they'll come up and they'll get the whole thing. Cause they'll just have a full worm that's hanging on to that. Um, you can also use a floating jig head and thread it, you know, through the nose of a live minnow and allow that to go down with the leader line hooked to some type of weight, whether you have split shot and a casting weight or a swivel and some type of bottom bouncing weight where you're casting out, let it sink to the bottom reel up your slack so you're tight to the bottom and then just let this float with a minnow off of a single floating jig head or a night crawler off of a floating jig head with the trailer. Or you can just use a, you know, regular old hook and just let a worm sit on the bottom. Those fish will mill around in there looking for insect larvae, looking for crayfish, looking for anything that they can find um, because all the vegetation is gone. So live bait is always your friend um, in cold water conditions because you just have to fish low and slow. Um, but if you want to kind of challenge yourself or you don't use live bait, um, then you're looking at using little small tubes, little small baby shad, you know, anything that's under two inches that you can put on a 32nd ounce weight 
um, maybe a 16th ounce if you have 12 feet of water and it's a little windy. So you just need that little bit extra weight to stand your, your float up. Um, but if your water's pretty shallow, you can use just a straight bobber. You don't need a slip cork and just put it on three feet above and cast out there. But pay attention to those days. If we get three, four days in a row where especially the overnight lows are above 50 degrees. If you get that for two, three days in a row, it's a good time to go hit your pond um, and look for shallow transition areas. So if you have any type of rocks, hardwoods, logs that are in that shallow that gets direct sunlight fishing from midday to four or five o'clock when that sun starts to get low, that's typically going to be your best fishing window during the winter. Doesn't mean you can't catch them at first light until noon, but having that that sun beating down on the water um, after midday when it's at its highest, especially if you have no wind, very low wind days, 10 miles an hour or less, um, that water temps in those shallows can come up pretty quickly and those bait fish will go up. And if it's been a few days, especially if it's been cold for a week straight and you just get a little nice bump in January or February for three or four days, that's the time to get out there because you're apt to find a really, really nice fish, regardless of species. Um, so look for any type of bait action. Um, if you can see minnows or fry, know that there's going to be a few predatory fish that are just a little bit off of them, but they'll, that'll push them up. Otherwise, you're always looking for the deepest parts of your pond that have structure breaks, whether that be logs, uh, stumps, root wads, brush piles, rock piles um or just natural bottom contour if it's stepped out in any way or there's a big channel break where fish can kind of hunker up to it cut banks um steep sloping banks those are going to be the areas that are going to hold the most fish at this time of year it doesn't mean that you can't just work the shoreline all day long and pick off fish um depending on you know what the fish population is you're always going to have fish that hold shallow um, just regardless. So you're going to find, you know, you might find a four pound bass or you might find a six inch bass um, or a sunfish or a crappie that's pushed up. Um, so in those cases, again, just working little profile baits very slowly along the shoreline. Um, if you don't have any option to get out in that deeper water on those warm days, you know, fishing the shorelines, you can find quite a bit of fish. Um, so another way to get at fish as opposed to fishing from a float or fishing vertically out of any type of float that you have, a kayak, canoe, John boat, little aluminum boat, um, is drop shotting. With drop shotting, it's great in the winter because you really don't have to worry about vegetative cover. So you're not pulling it through the moss or the weeds that are on the bottom, which can hang you up a little bit. Um, so for the most part, your pond is probably not going to have anything except for hard structure available um, in the winter months. So an eighth ounce or a 16th ounce, maybe up to a three sixteenth. probably don't want to get any heavier than that. Um, these are just little tungsten weights. You can use them in this cylindrical shape. You can use them in the ball shape. These work really well when you're in and around um, like brush piles and things like that. The more circ the ball drop shots, are better on kind of just a mud bottom or grass bottom where they, they have more of a tendency to kind of hop up, get stuck or tangle around where these will just shoot you straight down and you can run these across the bottom. So when you're setting up a drop shot at this time of year, again, being as close to the bottom as you can get. So you probably only want to be maybe eight inches, eight to 10 inches above where your hook's at. So when you're doing a drop shot, Again, fluorocarbon as your main line is great. Um, you can run braid with a fluorocarbon leader tied on. For that, you only need a two or three feet um, to put on. That's just going to give you that extra sensitivity because there's, there's no stretch in braid and there's very minimal stretch in fluorocarbon. So when fish just come up, all you might get is just a little tick of the line, but you can miss that with monofilament. Um, so if you're running a drop shot, doesn't mean you can't do it with monofilament. Um, it's just there are certain bites that you just may miss. So if you're using monofilament, make sure you're always tight to your weight down on the bottom because you really need to be able to have feel. If you get any slack in there, that could be the difference between make or miss. 
But when you're using drop shot, you're looking for a hook like this. Um, you know, it could be called an octopus hook. Uh, some hooks that are labeled drop shot hooks, they the big deal is where your eyelid is at. With this, when this is on the line, that's how it's on the line. So your hook point, you got a nice big wide gap all the way up the hook shank. That's one thing to look for is making sure that your hook point and your hook shank are parallel with each other. A lot of hooks, they'll come down and that hook point is going to be faced straight back at your eye hole. Well, the problem with that is, is a lot of times you get bit and you go to set the hook, but because that hook point is facing right at your eye hole, when you pull the eye hole, it's also pulling the hook point straight out. So if the fish opens its mouth, you're missing. What these do when your eye hole is faced straight down like this, you got a nice big wide gap and the hook point is facing more at kind of a 45 degree angle upward. When you go to pull and set that hook and that line's pulling out, it's turning the hook upward and it's catching the roof of the mouth, which ideally is always where you want to hook a fish. You get the most control when you hook them right here on the nose. You get them in the side, you get them down on the tongue patch, gives more opportunity for that hook to come loose. So drop shotting is great with hooks like this because more often than not you have a perfect hook set right on the roof of the mouth or right out through that front lip which gives you the most control so when you're tying these on you're going to use a palomar knot so this is 14 pound test just so you guys can see it but typically in the winter you're going to be using six to eight pound um either main line or leader line you don't need much more than that um but I double it over if I can get it through the eye hole. Otherwise, you can just put it one side in. Always go through the hook point side of the eye hole. So we want to go in through this way. We don't want to go in through that way. And you're going to put that line through. So the line's doubled over. We're going to just do a simple overhand knot like this. So we've made a loop. And on this end, we have our, our loop. And we're going to put the hook through that loop. And then you bring that up over the circle that you made. And then you're just going to pull tight. So again, make sure you leave yourself enough tag end. So I left about a foot of tag end, maybe 13 inches of tag end. What we're going to do to get this hook to stand up straight for a drop shot is you're going to take your tag end and you're going to go right back through your eye hole again on the hook point side, not on the back side. So you're going to go through the eye hole, come straight down and then pull that. And now your hook stands straight up on your line. So you see how this one, it's nice because instead of it being straight off, it kind of sags down a little bit. Again, when that fish comes up and grabs it, look where that hook point is face. It's going to come straight up when you're setting that hook. So this is perfect. We've got about 12 inches of tag. Your drop shot weights do not have eye holes. They have a little cinch, little metal cinch that's in there. So you can't tie a fishing knot. All you're doing is you pull this through. So I only want to be about eight inches up off the bottom. And again, when you're fishing a drop shot from the bank, you're going to get a little bit of slope. So as opposed to fishing vertically, where it is going to be every bit as much off of this, of your tag end for your leader to your weight, when you're fishing from the bank and pulling it in, you have to accommodate for just a little bit of drop, maybe up to four inches. So if you're fishing from the bank, probably want to keep it closer to that 10 to 12 inch below the hook. But if you're able to fish out of a float of any kind, then you probably only want to be to about, you know, six or eight inches because you're just straight above it. But anyways, with these, you don't need to tie a knot. So you get your line through there and all you do is grab both ends of the line and then just pull down cinch it tight and it stays on there i always tie just one overhand knot but just like that and then you clip the tag off leave yourself a little bit of tag on the bottom just so if it gets hit on anything hard and tries to pull you get a little bit extra to try to save you but if you try to tie any fisherman knot on here whether it be an improved clinch try lean knot you'll notice the second that you go to pull it tight, you're going to break your line every single time. So these aren't meant to have a, a knot tied on them. They're just meant to cinch tight. And if you want to throw an overhand knot onto it and then pinch it, that's fine. 
So this is what we're left with right here. So we got our drop shot rig. This is obviously a little bit bigger hook. Um, this is going to be, I believe this is a size one hook, but you're going to have size one, two. You don't really need to get much bigger than that. Um, and then you can go all the way down to size six, size eight hooks to drop shot for like crappie um, or panfish. So size one or size two hook like this is going to be great for bass. My favorite bait to use when I'm using a drop shot in a pond um, is going to be just a little stick worm, something like this, real small, three, four inch compact. These are Z-Man uh, Finesse TRDs. And with these, anytime you're putting on, it doesn't matter what type of bait you're putting on. You could put on a swim bait. You could put on a brush hog. You could put on any type of, of soft plastic onto these. But the big thing is, is that when you go to put them on the hook, Make sure that you don't go all the way through. All you're doing is just coming in maybe a quarter to a half an inch on the bottom of your bait. And then you want to come right out the nose of that bait. That way it sits better on the hook. If you were to go all the way through the top, it would sit funky on it. So this, this floats. So this is going to hit the bottom like this. And you can just dead stick it. You can throw it out near structure and you might only move your rod tip a couple of inches every five to 10 seconds. Um, and this is just going to sit there and it's just going to pulsate. And these are great. This works year round, but in the winter months, when you really want to get into some thick kind of brush piles or anything like that, these are great to just throw into and just let it sit there and really slow uh, you should be able to feel, especially with fluorocarbon, if you're in a brush pile, you can usually work these pretty easily if you go slow from getting tangled. If you start popping it a bunch and getting the weight swinging everywhere, then it can get wrapped around branches and you can get hung up where you're going to break this off. So the great thing about using a drop shot when you're throwing into like thick brush pile or into stuff that you typically, you're not going to throw into that um, unless you're Texas rigged, weedless where you can really work it through. You don't want to have a lot of line typically hanging off when you're in that type of cover. Um, but these weights will break off. So I wouldn't recommend using the tungsten weights because they're more expensive. But if you just get some regular old cheap pack of lead uh, drop shot weights, they'll break off the end. So you can get into your big lunker bass doing that and get them out of the brush without worrying about that back of the line getting hung up. Because if it does, if you have thick enough line or the branch isn't very big, it might break the branch for you and you get your weight back. Um, but worst case scenario, that weight gets wrapped, but it'll pop off um, because you're not, you know, it's, there's no knot on it. So a lot of tension will pop that off and then you can get the fish in. Um, but you can use lots of different drop shot baits. Um, some soft plastics are packaged uh, as such. You could even throw a live minnow on this. You just ran that right through the end of the mouth and then up between the two nose holes. You just have a live minnow sitting like that and just cast it straight out and just hold on. Just tight line it. That minnow is going to be a little bit off the bottom. He's not probably going to be able to swim your weight if you're using like little minnows. So he's just going to sit there going nuts um, and using live bait. That's great. You can catch a lot of crappie doing that. Um, if you're specifically targeting crappie or bluegill using a drop shot, then make sure you're using size four and smaller, but probably more of a size six hook. Um, you can still catch bass doing that. Um, but you, the bigger that hook size, you limit your opportunity for hookup. So, um, but yeah, drop shotting real, real fun way to, you know, you get, if you're tight line to it, you're going to feel that bite. You're either going to feel the, the bend over or a fish is going to grab it and pick it up and you'll feel that line tight. Um, but that this is probably the easiest way to cast and retrieve in while not fishing with the float to stay right along the bottom. Um, Cause you know that you're, you're regulated. If you're just casting something out that is, has a jig head or something like that, depending on your retrieve speed, depending on what's down there, and how it's bouncing along, you don't necessarily know where your bait is in the water column. By using a drop shot, you know at all times how far you are off the bottom 
because you're holding the bottom with that weight. So it keeps you within a foot of the bottom, which is ideal in the winter, even when you're fishing in shallow water. It just keeps it nice in that strike zone the whole way back in. But you don't need to work it a lot. Um, most people overwork drop shots. A lot of just pop, 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 pop. Even in the spring and fall when fish, fish are more aggressive, you just don't need all that. You're getting a ton of action just from two-inch movement of your rod tip that's moving it considerably underwater and all you're looking for is just those little subtle vibrations and a lot of still movement because you might get the fish's attention with six inches of kind of quick twitch but they're not going to if you keep doing that and it's moving and moving and moving that fish is going to look at it but it's not going to track to follow so having the ability to just get one quick action and then 30 seconds all the way to, I mean, you could hold it there all day long in one spot and a fish is eventually going to come over and get it just because this will just slowly pulsate in the water. So you can go up and get a red worm, get up to six to 10 inch, something like this. And these will just pulsate in the water. Um, you can use a curly tail worm. You can use any type of trick worm, flat worms, uh, you can even use little paddle tail swim baits, uh, but softer, softer baits, your Z-Mans, your Senkos that have a lot more action and are a lot lighter. These are going to be able to pulsate in the water without you doing much. If you get some of the more generic brand models um, and you can kind of feel that the soft plastics a little denser, those require a little bit more movement to get action out of it. And at this time of year, the less you do, the better. So electing for a bag of soft plastics that really have good buoyancy to them in the winter is going to help you get a few extra bites just because you, you're you doing less and the bait is moving for you just by its composition. So really good way to catch fish in the winter, drop shot and off the bottom. Um, see what else we got here. Again, feel free to... Throw questions up there as we're going along. Um, one big thing, so temperature-wise in the winter, what are you looking for? If you get under 40 degrees, it's probably not worth fishing. Um, fish are going to get real lethargic once you hit 42, 41, 40 degrees. Any, anything under that, you're going to be hard-pressed to get anything to bite. Um, but it doesn't take much. I mean, it could raise water temps up to the high forties, 47, 48 on one day, especially in the dead of winter, middle of January, you get a couple of warm days in a row, especially overnight lows that are above 40 degrees and ideally above 50 degrees. Then you can really see a change in 24 hours to go fish. Um, but for the most part, air temperatures, anything above 60 after noon you know after noon or one o'clock you can usually get a pretty good bite going for an hour or two is that water especially if you don't have wind wind's a big thing um even in the even on a south wind if the air temp's only 60 degrees but windshield makes it feel like it's 50 degrees because you got 20 mile an hour driving wind that's not that's not your ideal day you really want to look for those days that are bad days on big water but great days on small water in the winter which is Bluebird skies, no wind, lots of sunshine. Um, and on some days, if you got no wind, that might only be 50 degrees. That might be 55 degrees is enough. So you don't necessarily need to have 65, 70 degrees. Um, overnight lows, again, are big. The highs may only be 55, but the lows overnight are only 50. If there's not much movement um, in the low to high temperatures, if we have very stable air, um, without fronts that are pushing anything through, those are also good days to look for. Just consistent overnight lows or high temperatures without a lot of wind that are between 50 and 70 degrees in your small bodies of water um, can really turn that bite. Starting off looking shallow, always easier to pick off fish in the shallow water. If you can't find anything on that, then getting out into the deeper water um, with using a slit float or drop shot off the bottom or just live bait just fixed on the bottom. Um, but again, kayaks are great in the winter. I love pond fishing with the kayak. 
you can sit right over lots of structure and drop offs and just dead stick over the end. Um, it's great to, if you have just a little bit of a breeze, you know, not much, but five, five miles an hour, just something that most of the time you're sitting still in your boat, but occasionally it'll kind of push you in a direction. What I'll do with that is I'll try to center myself out over a Creek channel. Um, if I don't have just a piece of structure or a brush pile or down any type of cover where I can just fish vertically straight down on it. If there's not as much structure, I'm in a pond where maybe it's just kind of a bowl out in the middle um, or a Creek channel that runs straight through to the dam. Then it's great. Just set yourself, put your boat and get yourself angled to where the wind can push you and just start on that end and let the wind just kind of slowly push you. You can run multiple rods doing that. That's a great way to pick up crappie. Um, but you can find yourself some lunker bass, some lunker sunfish by just dead drifting tubes, swim baits, small stick worms, anything like that. You just drop them over the edge. Um, and if you have rod holders or if you just hold it in your lap, but as that wind pushes you, it's usually just enough. You'll get, if you're on a jig head, it's just going to swing like that as you're moving and you can obviously have great depth control. Um, so you just drop down straight to the bottom with whatever you're using, close your bail, crank one or two times to get yourself six to 12 inches up off the bottom, and then just allow the wind to just slowly push your boat. Um, I have lots of success for wintertime crappie doing that um, on ponds that I am familiar with where I know that there's a lot of crappie. Most of the structure is up in shallower water. So they kind of abandon those areas outside of their spawning window. And then over the summer months and they push out and they'll hold, uh, you know, they, most of the time they'll, they'll bed down low in that water column. Um, especially if there's any type of structure, a root wad, a stump, maybe some leftover vegetation that's down there. They'll, but every now and then they'll push up into the water column, especially on those warmer days if bait fish soak up to the, to the surface looking for some of that warmer air. Um, but it's great. You can just, you dead drift along that and you can do that all day long um, without really ever having to paddle. Just let that wind push you down to the other end of the pond, then paddle back and do it again. Um, and then just adjust your depth. If you're not having success again, I would stick with either a straight live minnow, little baby shad that are in a natural color. You may try chartreuse, um, but I typically find more success with natural colors in the winter. Um, unless maybe the water's muddy, the water is really stained. Then chartreuse is always a good option. Um, or white, um, those fish, when you get that muddy water in the winter, you'll notice when you catch fish that they lack a lot of that vibrant color on their side because you're not getting good light penetration. So that's when you look for your reds chartreuses whites and when you get that stained water the, if it's relatively clear pretty good visibility natural colors all day watermelon green pumpkins my favorite black and blue um, browns blacks uh, dark greens um, but stay away from pinks and whites and uh, you know really bright colors if there's fairly good visibility that's in the water um, but that's, that's a good way. If you, if you can't just vertically jig on top of down trees or brush piles or rock piles, if you're not having success just vertically on top of them, um, if you can get out in the water, then I would recommend trying just a, a very slow free drift um, with a couple of different baits at a couple of different depths. If you can swing it, if you have a couple of rod holders, maybe you hold on to one and let put one in the rod holder or the kayak. Um, and just do that. And once you figure that out on a pond, that's pretty much set. You catch fish all winter long doing it. Um, and it'll repeat year after year after year. So winter fishing ponds you're familiar with in the winter, it's a lot easier. Um, if you're fishing bodies of water you're not familiar with and you can't get physically on the water, uh, it can be tough because you're going to have to, you're going to want to move around a lot to really find where those drops are. Um, so if you go to a body of water you're not familiar with, start with the dam. Um, that's obviously going to be your deepest water consistently. And in most ponds, that is the deepest water. Uh, if you get any type of run in and it's an older pond, odds are that the channel is silted in considerably. Um, very few ponds that I've ever fished have a, 
a true defined creek channel just because they're old enough that they've they've been silted in. Um, but drops of just a foot can be enough to to hold a lot of your fish. So on uh, on days in the winter, definitely if you can get on the water, the better. But if you have to fish the bank, um, go to where you have your deepest drop offs, the closest to the bank, so you're not having to make extremely long casts because you really you're trying to fish as low and as slow as possible and the farther you cast out the more difficult it becomes to control that depth uh, especially if you're just straight casting and retrieving and not using a float or some type of you know bottom holding weight um, what else do we got here um, some other trailers to look for if you're bass fishing using a shaky head jig, football jig, something that you can run across the bottom pretty easily. You're going to have crawfish activity up until low 40s in the water. So bass will look for those, but you really start to lo you lose your frogs and your insects. So most of the time, your best bet is going with a bait fish presentation, but it doesn't mean that you can't catch fish using crawfish imitators um, or append lots of appendaged soft plastics um so good natural colors things like this anything that's got a little bit of blue or purple in it is also going to imitate your sunfish populations primarily your bluegill when you hold them you'll notice that iridescent shine across the side of them um so something like this where you get that little bit of purple in the green that actually, if you hold, if you hold this up in the sun next to a sunfish, it's, it's uh, impressive how much it will mimic that kind of shine. So anything that's got a little bit of purple flake in it or some kind of bright green mixed with a darker background, um, that'll get bass's attention for bluegill. Um, from a John boat in the winter. Yeah. If you can get, you get on the water, that's your best bet and drop shot for sure, or just straight vertically jigging. You don't really need to use a slip float if you're not fishing from the bank. Um, but trailers like this, so if you can get, you can Carolina rig. So Carolina rig, something that you're dragging the bottom. So this would, this ends tied to your main line. Then your back swivel is going to be attached to a, a leader line. And this is basically, you can drag this through the bottom. This can work well in the winter using a Carolina rig. Again, you just got to go incredibly slow, just a, a crank occasionally. So things like curly tails, um, curly tail worms that require you to have some motion to get that spinning isn't ideal. You're looking for something that's going to kind of float and kick up off the bottom that's got appendages. So using kind of bluegill pattern, brush hogs or green pumpkins. These are all, these are all great color patterns during the winter months. So they all look fairly similar, just some subtle variations. This one's got more of that purple and green. This is going to have more of that red and black. This one has the red and black with a little bit lighter base. And then again, we're back to more of kind of that purple and green. But these are good trailers to use off of the back with an offset hook. If you're using a Carolina rig or if you're using something like a shaky head jig where you're just moving this along the bottom, it allows the hook to swing. But again, the denser soft plastics are going to fold to the bottom and have no action quicker. Whereas you use something like the Z-Man baits or some of the Berkeley bait, anything that that's got a lot of buoyancy, these float. So if you put, you put a Z-Man soft plastic on a hook like this and your jig heads on the bottom, you're going to get a lot of action off the back of this hook. Whereas if I was to use something like this that sinks, I'm going to have to move it more often. So that's where, Really, all you're looking for is just a one to two inch pop of the rod tip. It's not a big jig all the way up that's going to move the bait way too far. So it's just half a reel turn. You might not even need to use the rod tip. You can just 
do it straight on the reel, but you don't really want to be moving more than an inch or two at a time. So bass fishing in the winter is laborious and tedious, and you might not catch a lot of fish, but you are apt to catch an absolute lunker at this time of year. Um, but you've got to go slow. But again, I am partial to fishing in ponds year round with as small a baits as possible. I like to catch lots of fish. I don't like to limit my opportunities of catching six inch fish. Um, so I'm always looking at using a 16th ounce, 32nd ounce, size four, size six, size eight hooks um, with bait profiles that are under two and a half inches. But it does not, there's lots, lots of good fishing action on these bigger baits. You just, you got to tell yourself when you get there that you got to be patient. Um, Cause you're probably not going to catch very many fish and you got to work a lot of areas and you might be thrown to the same log over and over and over again, hitting that fish in the head. And on cast 10, it decides it wants to bite. So just be prepared when you're, if you're going to bass fish off the bottom, um, or any type of cast and retrieve for bass, just be prepared for long, long stretches. That's why using a drop shot is valuable where you don't have to do a lot of the work and your bait is staying in the strike zone because that's the biggest thing. So that's why slip corking and drop shotting are your two best options in a pond in the winter, just because you can maintain depth unless you can get out on a boat or a kayak and maintain depth by just straight vertical, straight vertical over the boat you know what the depth is. So letting it fall down to the bottom, one or two reel cranks, now you know that you're a foot off the bottom, so you're right where you need to be. But if you try to play the guessing game, casting from the bank, using jigs, swim jigs, bladed jigs, um, Carolina rigs, Texas rig, wacky rigged, um, you're just you're going to be playing that game with yourself all day of wondering if you're moving too fast, not fast enough, Am I in the right zone? Um, so that's why I recommend using a drop shot you or weightless. Uh, again, I, I really enjoy fishing weightless if I can, because you can see that line get tight. It's a fun hook set and you don't have anything to interfere with your retrieve. You know, you're just using a straight offset hook um, or you can wacky rig it using the same hooks that you use uh, for drop shots use these for they work just fine for wacky rigging or you can buy the big extra wide gap wacky rigged hooks where the hook point is almost even with the uh where the eye hole is at but throwing those out weightless are great don't work with the z-mans um the z-mans float so you have to put a piece of split shot on so if you wanted to run uh, a wacky rig in the winter if you use anything, I can't really think of any other bait right now that floats like those Z-Mans do. Um, so usually you're you're pretty good. I mean, some of them are going to have different fall rates, but it's not going to be that much of a difference. But if you wanted to use a big, like five or six inch Senko, um, Senkos are great uh, for wacky rigging real nice pulse on them. So these are just the, I believe they're six inch is what the packaging is five or six inches. Um, but they make four inch, a three or a four inch smaller size. Either one's great. But with these, you know, you're just going to, you just rig this thing right in the middle, just like this, about as easy as it gets for rigging and try to get it as close to center as possible. So it's even off of both sides, just angles like that. Now this is fairly heavy. Um, it's going to sink real slow, but you can feel you got, you can cast this weightless, especially with like an open face spinning reel. You can cast this all the way across the pond. Um, so casting is not an issue with no weight on these. And you would just throw this out and just let it fall all the way down to the bottom until you see that your line's not moving at all. And then just, just a heavy six to 12, three to 12 or nine to 12, um, just a quick hard pop, just get that thing to come about two feet up off the bottom and then it'll just flutter back down and then let it sit. Sometimes bass will come pick them up off the bottom, but most of the time they're just hitting it when it's falling straight down. So going weedless, uh, weightless and weedless with an offset hook with like magic shad, um, 
or you can also do that with a Senko or you just go wacky rig. But if you are going to use any of those Z-Man baits, uh, the TRDs are great. You're going to have to put at least one piece of split shot about six or eight inches above the above your knot on the eye hole to get it to sink. Um, but again, you're going to get great action on those. Just be aware that when you go to cast, cast out any of those Z-Man soft plastics, they do need some weight because they will float. Whoa. Whereas all these other ones, a Yum Dinger is going to sink a little bit faster than a Senko. The... Uh, I think Strike Kings are called Tiki Sticks or something like that. Um, and they're, again, Yum and the Strike Kings are a little bit denser. You can feel it. They sink just a little bit faster. And these Senkos are a little bit softer, but they don't hold up as well. You typically, you can ruin a Senko on the first fish. Um, that's the nice thing about those Z-Mans is you can catch 100 fish on them. Um, and they're not going to rip that soft plastic. So you get great value out of them. But the detriment is you do have to put a piece of weight on, which is going to affect that drop time. So Senko with a wacky worm rig or just putting them straight on a offset hook. Three to five aught. Uh, I like a five aught hook with these uh, five or six inch stick worms, but you can use a three aught hook on them and it's plenty. Um, if you're going to use the smaller versions, the three and four inches, then you're going to be looking at a two aught or a three aught hook. But with these, I like red side down, black side up on fish, any type of prey, all, all your species of fish in the water, they're going to be brighter on the bottom, darker on the top. That's, that's just, uh, for predation purposes. If they are dark on the top, they match the bottom, helps them against avian predators. And if they're bright on the bottom, it looks like the sky for attackers from below. So always put your brighter side on the bottom, darker side on the top. But again, you just go through the nose and then you're going to pull it out about a quarter of an inch to a half inch up, work it up the hook shank and then turn it. And then that'll go up, rest like that. And then you're just going to bring, usually with a, a three to a five aught hook, you can put that hook point. You'll see just like an earthworm, there's kind of that little soft spot right here where all your ribs are on that so you want to run that hook point in that soft piece of plastic and then you'll pull it through and again just pull a little bit of that plastic up the hook shank and then just let it fall back on the hook point and now you're weightless and weedless so you could throw this out and you just let it sink all the way down to the bottom and so when you go to pop it you're going to get less water resistance because it's facing towards you so it's going to shoot through the water and then it's going to kind of dart when it falls. Whereas if you have it on a wacky rig, it's just going to straight pulse down. So you're going to feel the tension when you go to pop the rod with this. You should feel a little bit of resistance when you go to pop the rod just because it's going into the water like this. So when it falls, it's going to pulsate down. But either I've had success both ways. Um, but Usually you start hammering them wacky rig style or hammering them how you would Texas rig. You just don't need the weight. So it's just a weightless Texas rig, basically. Um, it's just whatever you get confidence in. I used to fish them Texas rigged without a bullet weight and just so just weightless and weedless. I fished them like that for ever and had success. And then in recent years, I've switched over to wacky rigs. Uh, either weightless or when the water is a little bit warmer, then you can go to a split shot, get it to fall down there a little bit quicker. Had success both ways. But when you're fishing ponds, I mean, I you're hard pressed to beat just a few different baits. You really don't need a lot. Um, you're looking at your stick worms, wacky rig or weightless. You're looking at maybe some magic shad, some type of jointed swim bait that you can fish weightless and weedless. And then you're looking at your baby shad, your tubes. Um, the, those are just always going to be tried and true. You're going to find fish wherever you go. It doesn't mean that on some ponds, you can't catch them on spinner baits or on jerk baits or on crank baits, lipless crank baits, anything like that. But as a standard rule to have success, sticking with small tubes, small swim baits and stick worms. That's pretty much all you need. You're going to, and on the smaller, these two and three inch stick worms, 
much smaller, you can catch big crappie and big sunfish on these. I mean, they can they can inhale these in. So you, this is this is my standard go to. Just a little three inch finesse TRD. These are great. You can fish them. You can fish them wacky rigged, which is great. You know, nice little subtle fall. Put a little piece of split shot on it. Let that fall down. Fish it on a drop shot. Fish it below a cork. So you could put this on a jig head and go below a slip float and just every now and then give it Bob or a jig. Um, but these are really a good kind of happy medium, not too big, not too small. They're going to catch monster bass. They're going to catch tiny bass. They're going to catch monster sunfish and monster crappie. Um, so you can get kind of a good intermediate action of different types of fish. If you stick with more of just a small tube or a small swim bait, something like this, you're going to catch everything. You're going to catch four inch sunfish all the way up to the biggest bass that you got in the pond. Um, so these are, I usually just have a pack with just this in it. And then if I, if I want to go crappie fishing, um, cause I catch lots of crappie on these tubes. I probably catch just as many crappie in ponds using a two inch or a one and a half inch squirm and squirt tube and, um, green pumpkin with red and black flake catch I've caught probably more crappie on these than I have using a more traditional crappie bait like this, but I'll keep a few of these just in case. Um, just cause these get, if you can catch them on swim baits and put them on a straight jig head, it's easier to replace the plastic. If you're using something like a tube, I like to internally weight them, which means I'm doing a lot more retying throughout the day. So typically I'll pre-rig them, throw them back into the pack pre-rigged, have that in my pocket, once they destroy the body or rip off too many of the legs, cut it off, tie on a new one. Um, but this right, this is pretty much my pond arsenal year round. I don't, I don't dally or dilly dally with much more than this. I've used just about everything in the ponds, but for consistent day over day success, season over season success, small tubes, small stick worms, small baby shad, natural colors, outfish, anything other than live bait. Um, so we got, we got about 45 minutes left. Um, if any, again, if anybody has any questions, throw them in there, uh, kind of go through some other approaches that you can take. The Ned, the Ned rig is becoming increasingly popular. You'll see them in your sporting goods stores. They look like this. The jig heads come in these, these come with a 10th ounce and a, one sixth ounce. I typically use the tenth ounce, but they'll you'll see, especially at Cabela's and Bass Pro, maybe even Academy, um, you'll find a wide array of just the jig heads that they'll sell. Um, and I like to keep the one tenth ounce and one fifteenth ounce. I don't find you don't find much of a need in ponds to get much above that one tenth ounce. Um, but these are great because they stand up on the bottom. So if you want to fish right on the bottom, you don't want to drop shot and get eight inches off. You want something buried right down in the dirt. Going with the 10th ounce. All right here. Um, I don't see. I don't think I have any of the 10th ounce on me. I think I just have the 6th ounce. Either way. But I'd elect for the smaller ones. So the 10th ounce ones or the 1 15th ounce ones, those are great. But these stand up, unlike your traditional ball jig head. You're going to see more brands. These are Z-Man brand um, for the Ned Rig, but you're going to see more brand. I've seen recently more brands that have, they're either labeled as a mushroom head or a Ned head, but they're going to look like this. It's going to be a kind of a mushroom cap shape. And what these do is when you let them fall to the bottom, they stand up. So these are great with any Z, you know, the Ned rigs are great. You just buy these and go straight out to your pond. Um, they come with a little crawfish imitator, kind of a little tube imitator, and then your finesse TRD. These ones just come in the straight green pumpkin. That's great. I typically will just buy a couple of packs of these um, and then a couple of packs of different jig heads um and then three or four bags of just these california craw which is 
basically that green pumpkin base, but it really gives you that red and black flake. And for some reason, just fish go crazy over that red and black, um, whether it's in creeks and streams or in ponds. Um, you just, this is just a great color. You have success just about anywhere. But so with these, again, great to use the floating buoyant weights, but you can use them with any type of soft plastic. So with these, all you're going to do, if you have a stick worm, if you have a crawfish trailer, you're just going to thread it onto the hook shank. So go right in through the nose and then you're going to pop it out right as you start. You want to get, I've found that if you get to where the, the bait holding clip is, where the nose, if you get the nose to that, wherever the back of your body is, that's a good time to bring the hook point through. That's usually enough. You don't want to go too far. You can, you can short them a little bit, but you don't want to get too much farther down there. So it should look just like that. So that's going to stand right on the bottom. So when your weight's down there and you can just, just a two inch, two inch movement. And all it's going to do is just come hop and hop and hop. These are great. These are Ned rigs are becoming, I mean, they've been popular in the Midwest. It's Midwest style fishing. Um, it's really gained some traction in the last several years. So you see a lot more different brands producing these types of jig heads, but this is a very versatile way. So in the winter, it's great because on a pond, you probably don't have bottom vegetation in the winter. If you do, uh, they make these jig heads with a weed guard. So if you have, a, if you're in Southeastern Oklahoma, Eastern Oklahoma, if you, if your water tends to stay clear year round and you keep vegetation, especially out into the deeper water, you're going to want to elect to get by the heads by themselves that have a weed guard. Otherwise, central Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma, western Oklahoma, you're probably going to have pretty barren bottoms and you can work these through brush piles just like you would a jig. Um, but these are great. Nice low profile. Smaller baits always work better in the winter. Doesn't mean you're not going to catch that big lunker on just a 10 inch worm. Um, but you're only going to catch that lunker on that 10 inch worm with these, you're going to pick off lots of different sizes of fish and different species of fish. But the best way to fish these in the winter is just to let them fall straight down to the bottom. So cast to a spot, leave your bale open, let it fall all the way down to the bottom, close your bale, reel up slowly until you can feel the bait. And then from that point on, just, just a little hop, let it hop, reel up until you feel it, let it sit there for a minute, pop it again. Um, and again, you're just waiting for a fish to just come down and grab it. You're probably not going to feel much. It's not going to be a slam double over the rod. Now, as you get into spring and summer with these, then they're very versatile. You don't have to just hop them all on the bottom. You can straight swim them in, swim and pop. Um, but these are just a great option for if you want to fish down along the bottom. If you're using the shaky head jigs, um, football jigs, anything like that. You're, these are just going to give you more of a vertical presentation when they're on the bottom. Um, and you, again, you can just dead stick these and these will just sit right here and just the little bit of current that's in every body of water. It's just going to make that tail just move a little bit. So this can mimic a crawfish. This can mimic a bait fish that's just feeding down in the mud. Um, so pretty good option in the winter to go to a Ned head. If you want to get a little bit more action, um, for yourself you want to make lots of casts lots of action um going to a net head's perfect but if you really want to just dissect the body of water that's when you're drop shot and you're just dead sticking lots and lots and lots of dead sticking um during the winter months but good option z-man makes a lot of different options for these so when your water temps are above 45 degrees you might elect to use something that has more appendages on it that's more of a crawfish imitator. They also make just a straight crawfish. So these are these are pretty cool. These work great in creeks and ponds. Um, but you can for these you can hook them straight to the to the net head. You just go in through the go in through the back of them, and then run it all the way down the hook shank until you hit the hit that bait holding clip, and then you can pop it through doesn't really matter which way you go. You can pull them up through the back like this and
But the one drawback to these Z-Man baits that uh, is helping you with the buoyancy, you also only get one chance to get them through with the hook point. Because once that hook point's there, the way that these things are made, you're never, you can't get the hook point back through. So these things can take a ton of abuse from the outside. You can catch fish all day long on the same bait. If you buy a bag of finesse TRDs or really any of their baits, but like I said, I like to use those finesse TRDs as my stick bait for either a drop shot or running wacky rigged. Um, they can just, uh, you can catch a hundred fish on them and still use the same deal. But if you ruin the guts of them, so if you don't get that hook point through on the first time in the right place and you go to adjust it and you go to pull it back out, well, first off on the Ned head rigs, you're not getting it back over that bait holding clip. And it'll do, you'll notice the same thing. If you don't have a bait holding click, you just, you can't move that. And what it'll do is it'll start to wear the inside of it and then they don't float anymore and they don't do what they're supposed to. So one drawback of the floating Z-Man soft plastics is once you rig them, they're there to stay, but you can just, they take so much abuse without ripping. So, I mean, you can, you can pull those legs all the way back doesn't compromise the bait at all. It goes right back to what it is. So, but something to pay attention to. I lots of learning lessons on those. You'll, you'll ruin a few of them because it's just, it happens to all of us, but something to pay attention to when you first put it on there, make sure you, you know where to poke that hook point through. Um, but they make lots of different, different types. So things like this, but once you, once that water temp gets below 45 degrees, straight bait fish. So that's where stick worms work great. Cause this can be just a bait fish feeding down along the bottom. Um, and then when it's dropping, it looks like a dying minnow. Uh, but when you get to the really, really cold days of middle of January, early February, very much dead sticking drop shot becomes probably your best bet. Um, and you can use a 10 inch trick worm or a three inch stick worm or some type of, uh, you know, minnow imitating drop shot bait, something like this. But again, I would, I would use that, this color over my kind of thread fin shad over here. This is, this is just going to pick up more fish in a pond, uh, than like a caffeine shad and white. I'd stick, I'd stay clear of those. If you're going to use kind of flat worm or little minnow for drop shotting or to put on a jig head, stick with those green pumpkins, watermelons, black and blue, just real dark natural colors. Um, let's see. So paddle tails like this, again, throw this on a jig head and just slowly reel this along the bottom and let that paddle just kind of look like a minnow is just kind of trying to feed down along the bottom. These work good on like a shaky head jig um, or just a straight standard good old fashioned lead round head. Throw a one eighth ounce quarter ounce jig head on top of this. Let them sink down to the bottom and just reel as slow as you can go. And it'll just drag down along the bottom. Tail will be up about three inches off the bottom and that little paddle will just kick for you. But you want to go as slow as possible. So if you do elect to use some type of swim bait with a jig, um, stick to those, those natural colors, the greens and greens and browns. Uh, or you do the same thing with the with your crawfish or kind of mud bugs, any any other appendage deals, all these types of things. But once you get to water temps under, you know, these are gonna work right now. Um, but as we get into January, if, it's always great to keep you can get a real cheap water temp, it's just a little stick. Put that, keep one of those in your bag when you get to a pond and drop it in, see what the water temps are. Um, that can be helpful because sometimes it's a lot colder than you think it is, but more often than not, it's a lot warmer than you think it is on some days. So 
you see those water temperatures in the shallows in the low 50s, you know that it's probably going to be a pretty good day of catching fish up shallow, especially if you get all the elements of clear blue skies, sun beating down on you, lack of wind. Um, haven't really touched on catfish, you know, channel cats. Flatheads are out of the question. Um, water temps below 50 degrees, 45 degrees. Flatheads are just dormant. So if you have, happen to have a bigger pond or a watershed pond that has flatheads in it, you, you're just, they don't bite in the winter. Um, your channel cats, lots of scented baits. Typically, if I want to try to catch channel cats in the winter, what I'll do is I'll try to catch some bluegill, cut the bluegill in half, take that tail end, throw it out into that channel. But you can use your punch baits, your stink baits, anything like that. But again, you're just looking for the deepest depressions for those channel cats. Um, they might roam around if you want to try. If you get, let's say we have three or four days in a row where the low temperatures are hovering right around 50s and the high temperatures are in the 60s, maybe even getting close to 70. You might try fishing at night up around the banks. You might get some channel cats that'll come up and, and cruise. But for the most part, fishing for channel cats in the winter cast to the deepest spot of your pond and just let it soak but hot dog punch bait stink bait natural bait um cut shad cut bluegill anything that you can use fish entrails egg sacs if you have liver or anything you've frozen from the spring for catfish bait but um there's it, there's not going to be much of a rhyme or reason to it. Uh, fishing around the full moons tends to get some more bites um, for all your species, bass, catfish. So like right now, to, I wouldn't really say we're in winter fishing yet. We're kind of in that transition. We're, we're into late fall. Um, we have, we've had cooler temperatures, but water temps in ponds right now have not, you know, crested into that zone where they're 40 degrees yet so you're still going to have pretty good fishing action um this would be a good weekend for fishing if you're not getting in the deer woods uh weather's supposed to be pretty nice tomorrow a uh, little windy but that wind isn't as important this early as you get a little bit farther in when we get those overnight temps in the 30s and 20s then any wind from any direction is going to hurt you on clear blue sky days and if it's cloudy days that's it's really not going to warm up the temperature that much if you don't even if the outside air temperature is 65 but it's cloudy and the wind's blowing that's not going to help warm up your pond so you're really looking for those bluebird lots of sunshine no wind days but this weekend ought to be pretty still pretty good pond fishing um as we transition over into the winter um we've had these two days in a row with low this morning was a little chilly, but tomorrow morning is not very chilly and Sunday morning is not very chilly. So lots of sunshine this weekend um, and higher temperatures be a good time to get after them. Um, you still might have some bass depending on where you're at in the state, what the pond temperatures are. You, you might still have some decent fall bass action. Um, and with that, you're obviously you, what we've just talked about. You're gonna, you can catch fish on that. Um, but you still might have some fish that are willing to give chase to something that's a little bit faster, whether it be a, a bladed spinning bait of some kind, um, any type of hard crank bait, or if you're just working um, some type of sassy shad um, or bait fish imitator, soft plastic with a jig head, you might still be able to find fish that are willing to give a little bit of chase. But here in a, in a week or two, you're, that's probably over with outside of maybe the far southeast of the state. Um, and then you're going straight into dead sticking, slip cork, vertical presentation, um, or just weedless and weightless and letting it sink down to the bottom. Um, anybody have any questions? Uh, that kind of runs me through most uh, of everything that I had. Um, like I said, it's, it's kind of drop shot or slip cork or vertical um, at this time of year. Doesn't mean you can't catch fish by cast and retrieve. Um, like I said, you're always going to have fish that are shallow um, and you're always just going to have some fish that just act differently than other fish. So running beetle spins, rooster tails, those can be secondary options that you might pick off some fish. 
Uh, if you, as we get into late winter, as you know, end of February, early March, and you're starting to see that shift back towards pre-spawn fishing for largemouth and crappie, um, you can get a little bit more aggressive on those warmer days than you know, slip corking with a lot of jigging action can pick up fish. Um, but really, if, if you're just looking to catch the most amount of fish uh, on any given day, downsize natural colors. So keep it under two and a half inch bait profile. Keep it in a 16th to a 132nd ounce. Keep your line to four to eight pounds, eight, you know, eight at the heaviest, but six pounds is a really good happy medium. I like the winter because I have a lot of my lighter action rods uh, rigged up for trout. So those work great for fishing the ponds um, the way that I like to fish them at this time of year with four to six pound test on medium light to medium action rods. Um, you, you really, if you hit a lunker fish, like I said, you might get one good run out of them, but after that, it's typically just forking in dead weight, you know, especially that's probably here now, but a month from now for the next three months, it'll be like that. If you hit a six, seven pound fish, you're going to feel a lot of weight, but you're less likely to have that fish tear off underneath something, take you on a big run. Um, so using six pound test is typically enough. You don't need to be using 30 pound braided line to fork fish out of where they're at. You can typically get them out fairly easily. Um, but braided line as your main line tied to fluorocarbon leader, um, is a great setup on a medium action rod. I like 10 pound braid with seven pound fluoro leader, um, two or three foot leader running that for a drop shot. Um, and then if I'm going to go slip corking, uh, I'll use monofilament line because I want it floating across the top. Or you can use braided line um, with either a fluoro or monofilament leader. But if you're going to use slip cork, you don't want to use uh, fluorocarbon as your main line because it'll sink. So if any of your lines down on the water, it's going to work against the bobber. Um, so that's something to think about. But most of the time, you're not flipping heavy cover because there's just not weeds. Really, the only thing that that braid is helping you with in the spring and the summer using 30 pound, 50 pound braid uh, is you can get the fish out of just that thick vegetation, whether it be weeds or moss or hydrilla um, braid just to, helps you get those fish out. This time of year, you're, you're dealing with a big brush pile. Um, but the problem with using braid in a pond is, is if they, you really get wrapped up in a brush pile with braid, you're not getting that fish out anyways, unless you can pull the entire brush pile in. Um, but you're using bait profiles that don't really call for using a heavy action rod. So you run the risk of breaking your rod tip. Um, so you really, you don't want to play around with that, with the heavy stuff, just cause you're going to end up cutting your line. And if it's your pond, if it's a neighborhood pond, um, I really don't recommend using braid without some type of monofilament or fluorocarbon leader just because more often than not you got to cut your line which means there's 20 30 yards of braid now that's out there and you know you hit that line all the time when you're fishing um a lot of times you think you're getting bit and you end up hooking back into that line so your fishing ponds try to keep it to where you can keep the water pretty cleaned up don't use 20 pound monofilament you know four to four to ten pound test is plenty anything where you can break at the eye hook. If you're using line that with your rod and your reel, you can't break your knot, that's too heavy in a pond. Um, you're you're going to be able to land any size fish with, with using that lighter tackle. Um, so it's just not necessary. Um, and if you do get into the spring and the summer and you have heavy vegetation and that's all you're using, it's just in that, that's great. You can pull out of it. But if you're fishing around hard structure and cover like brush piles, down logs, trees, um, and you bury a hook into it, you're just probably not going to be able to um, break your knot or pull it loose. Um, so steer steer clear of the braid on, on that set. But I don't see any questions coming in, so we might end this a little bit early if, if nobody's got anything. Um, trying to think of anything else that is 
really important. Uh, I mean, if we just to summarize what, what we went over, um, we're looking in the winter time. You want to see a couple days in a row of some lower overnight low or higher overnight lows. If it's over 50, great. Um, but even if it's been down in the 20s and now it's all of a sudden in the 40s, that's going to change a small body of water rapidly. Um, you're looking for sunny, non wind, bluebird sky days. Those are your best days fishing from after lunch until you know an hour before sunset that's going to be your your fish are going to be most active you're also going to find more fish in shallower areas so looking on those types of days if you have any type of bank structure whether it be riprap maybe some hardwood logs something that can absorb that uh, energy from the sun and kind of radiate the heat in that water, making it two or three degrees warmer than the surrounding water. That's really going to attract in any of your minnows, shiners, shad, bait fish, fry, which is going to draw in predators. Um, and in those cases, again, you know, depending on what the bait profile of your uh, pond is, sticking with smaller sizes, the two inch, the inch and a half, it's going to do a great job of mimicking that small bait. And when it's not moving that much, you're on a slip cork, you're dead stick, you're vertically jigging, or you're on a drop shot, you're just leaving it right in front of the fish's face. Um, and you're going to get bit more often than not using just small, non-intrusive, very natural looking baits um, for those fish. That's really what they're looking for at this time of year. Um, so any, anywhere where you have that kind of hard structure up against the bank that leads out to deeper water on those warm days, that's, those are going to be the areas to start first. Uh, if you can get out on the water, that's always best in the winter. So kayaks, canoes, um, if you got neoprene waders, maybe you get out in a float tube, uh, or just a little John boat, little, uh, paddle boat, anything, that you can get out, uh, you're going to have more success just because you can fish low and slow without having to get on the reel. So when you're floating, you can just do a lot of dead drifting, a lot of dead sticking just over the sides. Um, but it's the time of year where you'll surprise yourself if you're fishing for crappie or fishing for sunfish and you're using little tiny baits like this or little tiny baby shad, um, something like this again with the bass, they're going to be less likely to take this chartreuse color. Now that's not probably going to turn off the crappie um, or even the sunfish, but bass tend to get a lot finick more finicky in the winter time with unnatural colors. They just have a tendency to go after the blacks and blues, green pumpkins, red and black flake. Um, but if you are using a uh, more natural colored baby shad, something that's maybe black, black and blue, something like this, you could use this underneath the slip cork and you're jigging along and all of a sudden your bobber goes under. And before you know it, you got a five pound bass hooked up into a little inch and three quarter baby shad on a 32nd ounce hook. But it is the right time of year to be able to hold on to bigger fish with smaller hooks. So in, as the water gets colder, it firms up their mouth real good. You'll notice when you catch bass in the spring and the summer, um, as the water temperature is warm, that film around the front of their lips really gets loose. It's really easy to tear it. Even the inside of their mouth is really easy to tear. You'll notice in the winter, if you bury a 32nd ounce, 16th ounce, size four, size six hook into their mouth, even in that little film, you're not, you'll notice there's not much of a tear. It really firms their mouth up. So using small bait profiles, not only are you getting bit more often with big fish, that are willing to take that bait, but you have a better hookup success as well as being able to hold on to the fish. Whereas if you're using a 32nd ounce in June, you might hook into that six pounder, but he's really active at that point. So you're using four pound test. You might get spooled. You might get broke off. You might not be able to play the fish or the second that that fish goes airborne or turns on you, they're able to work that small, tiny hook out of their mouth. That's why most typically you see bass fishing. If you're using a hook, it's going to be a three aught to a five aught thick wire offset hook, just because you can bury that in there and have lots of control. That hook points way up there. 
And when it's in that film of the fish's mouth, it's down here. You got a lot more room to work with to keep tight to hold that fish on. Whereas if you have a 32nd ounce, 16th ounce hook, something that's your hook shank is only going to be, you know, that big. Well, that gets up in that film in the summertime where it's really loose. That'll just fall right out when you're fighting the fish. So it makes it much more difficult, but you don't have that problem in the winter. Their mouths are all pulled up. Uh, left is over. Yeah. Overflow standpipe that I'm, you get fish that'll stack up on that. Um, golf course ponds. If you have access to golf course ponds that you can fish where they do irrigation or anything like that, they can be running water. That water will be a little bit warmer. Anytime you can find current in the winter. I mean, any time of year you can find current. Uh, that's great. But little subtle changes in the winter is going to just stack fish into, you know, very condensed areas. So, uh, the smaller the pond, the easier it is sometimes, but that's not always true. If they all go stack out in one spot in the middle, you just have to be able to find that spot and find the bait profile they're looking at. And if you can do that, you can have just as much success in the winter catching fish as you can in the fall or the spring. Um, it's just really all about understanding what the composition of the bottom of the pond looks like and what those fish are favoring. And then utilizing the knowledge of weather during the winter and water temps to kind of base where you think that fish should be moving or holding to. But um, the more you can get out to the same pond uh, in the winter, the better. The more you fish the same pond, the more familiar you become with it. But if you happen to be fishing a small body of water at this time of year that you're not overly familiar with, um, using what we've talked about through this, use those as your starting point. Um, but if you have success in the ponds and everything I've talked about is stuff you haven't used, but you have success, by all means, keep using that. Um, we we set these Ask an Angler up to to keep them to where trying to it, give information to catch as many fish as possible. Um, so things that just work more often than not, but it doesn't mean that there's not some bait that you can throw in a pond that just outfishes everything else that has not, that is nothing that we just talked about. But more often than not, tubes, small swim baits, stick worms is all you need in a pond year round. Um, but in the winter, it gives you the opportunity to really downsize because you want to be low, close to the bottom and as slow as you can move something. So any baits that naturally have action on their own, things that have lots of appendages, uh, baits that if you just hold them still, there's just that little bit of pulse. So when that's sitting in the water, it's just, just very subtle, but that's enough. I mean, that's going to get a fish's attention. Um, so baits that have lots of action on their own that you can dead stick are going to be better than harder, more dense, soft plastics that require more action from the angler to get them to have bait action. Stick with the softer, the softest, um, plastics that you can use that are the least dense that you can just feel that when you hold on to the soft plastic that it's going to sink slower when it's in the water with less movement from you as the angler it still has action without you doing anything those are just little things that are going to help you pick up those extra fish um, you're still going to have reactionary fish that are willing to bite um, depending on what the population of fish is in a pond um, size structure of those fish lots of different factors can influence how active different size classes of fish are um you know if fish are starving and they haven't eaten and you put food in front of them you know more than likely you're going to get bit um if fish have plenty of uh prey species if you got a pond that's just loaded with bait and you're trying to catch bass then you're going to have to go to where those bass are which is going to be in deep thick cover that they can get in so if you can throw a live minnow or any type of bait you want to get it into that because if that's where you got lots of dense bait balls that'll hang out around that then those bass have easy picking um you know naturally so you're fighting against that because those bigger bass are only going to eat a couple times a day in the winter um that's why if you get a big push of a warm front for several days where those fish see an opportunity to get up in the shallows and really feed on some calorie rich bait fish 
then it can be a great time to go with, you know, those jerk baits running big, big profile, six to eight inch jerk baits um, that are real slow rising. If you, cause you might even see fish that are pushing up on the bank. Um, so that's always something to pay attention to when you're out on the water, look at those shallow areas that are near those deep transitions. Um, and if you see surface breaking or, any type of commotion up against the bank where it looks like predators are hurting bait fish, then you might elect to fish a little bit faster um, with a paddle tail swim bait or maybe a spinner bait or an, I like a jerk bait, just something that you can work real quick, but it's going to hold and pause and give that fish the opportunity that if it's just sitting there, because a lot of times you'll get little holes um, that are cut out near shallow banks where it's just a little light depression and they'll get those bait fish up on the bank and they'll just sit right in a little depression right next to it. And all they're waiting is for that bait ball or a single fish to come up over and they come and grab it. So working jerk baits parallel with, you know, that kind of deep transition to shallow water that can be effective on those really, really warm days that you've had three or four days of overnight lows that are in the high forties, low fifties. Um, but that's more of a visual thing. Um, so always, you know, keep kind of a, a jerk bait or some type of, you know, very reactionary bite bait in your tackle box or in your bag when you go to the pond. Um, but that's more, that's not going there with that already tied on. That's fishing and listening and watching. And if you start to see that start to happen, then you can switch over and, you know, you more than likely are going to be finding those one to three pound fish that are willing to go do that. But every now and then there might be just a lunker that's sitting in a hole up against that shallow, just looking for something to come up above it. But they're also going to take that weightless stick worm. They're also going to take that tube. It's just about getting as many casts and putting it right in that fish's face. So, um, with that, that's uh that pretty much covers it for winter pond fishing. Um, uh, rain, a warm rain, let's say it's 50 degrees and it's raining um, for a day or two, that's going to warm a pond up in the winter. Uh, so, and that's going to stain the water a little bit. So when you get those stain days, if you're fishing, you know, darker, darker, muddier water, um, using something like lighted big where you can pop it, but it's giving it lots of vibration, lots of noise can attract a fish out of cover real quickly. If you're running it along a log or through a brush pile or down a Creek ledge, Creek channel. Um, that's something to look for in the winter. It's a warmer rain. If it's in the fifties or low sixties and raining, um, and it's been cold before that. So that, that can cause an uptick. Um, and then sometimes staying in the water, you get some, uh, rain that comes in at 50 degrees and then it stays warm for a couple of days that uh, milkier water all those particles that will warm quicker when the sunlight hits it in the shallow so muddy shallow water on warm days you can look for bass in that um, but if you're looking for your bluegill your sunfish if you know where you're, if you got stumps that are out along a creek channel or in the creek bottom, or if you have spider blocks or any type of structure in that deep water, um, dead sticking vertically above slip cork or just fishing bait right up off the bottom, little night crawlers, uh, things like that. You can find some really big sunfish at the, this time of year, but you're probably not going to get them to chase. Uh, they're, they get real hard to catch when they're suspended up in the middle of the water column in brush piles. It's hard to get them to bite. Um, typically your big active sunfish are going to be tucked up against little channel breaks, but especially root wads, stumps, things like that. Uh, and if there's any grass cover around it, looking for those areas in a pond, they're typically not going to be far away from where their spawning areas were. So if you can identify big bedding areas, you know, your soccer ball size circles all over the place. Um, if there's any type of ledge or point or drop off from that, um, that's where those sunfish are going to be. They don't, they won't typically go too far in a pond just because bass and catfish, they're on the menu for almost their entire life. Um, you know, it really takes them getting up to 10, 11 inches 
unless you got some 10 or 11 pound bass, usually a four or five pound bass, it might choke to death trying to go after that. And they usually have more forage. So there's no need for them to go after those 10 to 12 inch sunfish. But at this time of year, it's great to catch a bunch of crappie or a bunch of sunfish. The meat's nice and firm in that cold water. It's not mushy. You get really nice fillets off of them. Um, it's a great time of year to, to get those winter kind of pan, you know, too cold to throw the fish fry outside, but you know, skillet, cast iron skillet, or just a pan fried, um, sunfish and crappie. It's also a good time of year to manage your crappie before you get into the spawn. Um, you know, they've already kind of cycled out. So you got your fry and then you have your different size classes of crappie. So if you have a pond that you get into crappie pretty good in the springtime, winter's a great time to catch them and kind of help your structure of your fish out. Um, if you're looking to maybe increase the size of the crappie, or maybe you're trying to improve your bass fishing by, you know, taking out a lot of those, um, you know, six to 10 inch crappie, six to 12 inch crappie, somewhere in there. Again, that meat's going to be nice and firm. You get great fillets off of them. Um, and you can really get into some great wintertime crappie fishing because at this time of year, they're usually stacked up pretty tight in some part of the water. Um, I typically find them out over the main creek channel. Um, they'll suspend if there's any grass. Uh, they'll just kind of be loosely schooled throughout the deepest part of the pond. And the easiest way to catch them is in a kayak or some type of float where you can just dead drift right over the side. And it might not be fast and furious where it's like it hits the water and it's on like it is during pre-spawn. Um, but it can still be pretty prolific if you have ponds that have a good number of crappie in them. Once you find them and how to catch them, you can pretty much hit repeat all winter long. Um, and it's a great way to help manage your pond for crappie. And they just, they're real easy to clean. You know, you can put a bucket in the back of your kayak and fish all day without worrying about, you know, the fish getting warm, um, ruining your meat. So it's a good time to catch pan, pan sized fish. Uh, just because the meat's so good at this time of year, nice and firm. Um, do you have to weigh down Christmas or cedar trees? Uh, yeah. Uh, attaching them to cinder blocks is going to hold them. Um, the, uh, you know, if you're going to put, put out that type of structure, if you're going to send them down with cinder blocks, you know, using uh, wire, thick, thick wire, thick steel kind of cable, to tie them to crimping them to the cinder block is going to work best. You can use a rope. Um, but if you get he if your pond is susceptible to heavy flooding where the water is coming in from one direction, uh, that's something to be mindful of when you, when you put in your own structure, a lot of times that stuff will break free and it can, you know, move into different areas of the pond. But, uh, yeah, it's a great, uh, if any deer hunters are on here, uh, if you got ponds at your house or your neighborhood that you kind of manage, it's a great time of year when you go out deer hunting and you're cutting cedars, you know, bring a few of them home or Christmas trees that, you know, you got to get rid of them instead of taking them to the dump, throw them in your pond. Um, but yeah, weighing, weighing them down for sure. Uh, putting them in and then where do you put structure, right? What, where's the best place to put structure? So if you're looking for good winter habitat for fish, obviously in the deepest parts, putting, you know, you could put them on both sides. Your cedars and your Christmas tree is going to get a year of life with the needles still on them. Um, and then maybe two to three years of really good habitat. And then after that, you're going to want to dump on top. But if you have one particular place, let's say you have a pond that's less than two acres, um, finding a spot that's near your, uh, your bedding area. So where your bass bed, where your bluegill bed, where your crappie bed, going straight off from that, finding the, the nearest deepest spot adjacent to your uh, spawning areas, that's where you want to dump those piles. Um, typically that means you can probably cast to them from the bank, um, but that's just a good natural highway for fish to want to get out to. Um, and anywhere where you can put it near a drop that moves up into shallow water 
that's going to hold a lot of fish there, which is going to improve your shallow water fishing on those warmer days because those fish are right there. They're going to pop up. Easy way to get into that shallow area when it warms up to feed and then get immediately back into that um, cover. So that's those are kind of the spots that you're looking for. If you just randomly put brush out, you're going to hold some fish. But if you really want to create habitat in a small pond that's going to hold a ton of fish, putting it near transition areas where they're spawning, um, that's going to be your that's going to be your best bet. Um, if you just go dump it out in the middle by the dam, yeah, it's going to hold some fish, but it's going to be sporadic. It's not always going to hold fish. If you put it near those drops um, by creek channels and spawning areas somewhere in between that you're going to hold fish year round, but in the winter, you can really hold a significant amount of fish. Um, putting some type of buoy um, where those brush piles are, you can, you can put a bobber, just tie a little, uh, just circle bobber fishing line and put it on it. Um, especially if you know the depth and tie it to it. Uh, so you know where it is. That's always helpful. A lot of times, again, you get lots of flooding. It'll move those brush piles around so if you tie a bobber to it, if one gets loose or it starts floating, you can kind of see where it's at. Um, so that's, but yeah, it's a great time of year to, to do fish habitat um, and then just management. If you can get into crappie, it's a great time of year to, to manage your crappie before you get into the spawn. It's a, not the best time of year. I'd say fall. Fall is a great time of year to manage your bass populations because they're just so actively gorging that you can catch a lot of those smaller fish. Um, in the winter, you're more likely to catch more mature um, bass than you are those the little ones. Um, that's just a byproduct of the smaller a fish is, the the higher up it is on the food menu. So typically, you're going to catch your bigger fish at this time of year. Um, but it's a great time to manage your crappie. But if your vegetation's at its lowest, so if you want to put in brush piles, um, if you usually your water will be at its lowest in January. We typically, December is usually a fairly high precipitation month, um, but typically once we hit January, January and February are usually pretty dry. So your pond is is going to get pretty low. That's a good time to do um, any type of bank management. Um, if you can get in there and create better bedding areas for them by you know leveling out a side of your pond, um, digging out, you know, creating, if it gets really low, if you can get out there and maybe dig out some ditches and some drop-offs that are near the bank, that'll help you hold more fish, um, throughout the course of the year. But yeah, winter, winter is the, your best time to do pond management. So you want to put any structure in, you want to try to clean out any size sizes of fish, um, to help with population. It's a good time of year, um, especially when it's your own pond, um, with that, that brings us up to three o'clock. Don't think, uh, don't think we got any other questions. Um, if you received the email for this uh, course, my, you have my contact information. My cell's on there. Call or text. Send me an email if you ever have fishing questions. That's what I'm here for. Um, that link also had all of our Ask an Angler course, a link to all of our Ask an Angler courses. So um, if you came in late to this one. Um, you can, you can go back and watch it on our archive. It'll be live on our website here in the next five to 10 minutes. Um, and you can find all of our stuff there. Check out our fishing resources page, uh, wildlifedepartment.com. We always keep that updated with uh, seasonal specific information, species specific information. Um, but yeah, if you got any questions, let me know. Uh, and hopefully this will, these little tips will help with your winter pond fishing and, and best of luck out there. But this is, it's a great time of year to fish when, if you get nice weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, 65 degrees, no wind. Most people just, they stop thinking about fishing, whether it's holidays or deer season, or it's just, they have it in their mind that you just don't fish in the winter for warm water species. If the water temps are above 45 degrees, have at it. You can, you can figure out your ponds and, and really get good at um, catching those fish in the winter. And it extends your your fishing season year round. So with that, uh, have a uh, happy Thanksgiving next week and happy holidays and stay safe out there and tight lines until next time. We'll see you. Thanks for watching.